Hey y'all, Trevor here with Right of the Leaf, and today I'm lucky enough to have Wallace with me from Primo Cannabis. He wears a couple of hats over at that facility, which really helps just let him guide where they're going in the industry, head of cultivation, QA, as well as just a person with the security clearance, so somebody of authority that is recognized by Health Canada in the uh, licensed producer facility. So with that, I'm excited to talk cannabis and running those smaller facilities with Wallace today. So thank you for coming on and uh, joining me today. Yeah, no worries, Trevor, man. I'm, I'm happy that you were able to invite us on and I'm happy to talk about Primo. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be learning about your company. I With you reaching out, it was the first time of me hearing about your LP. I'll be honest. I don't get a lot of exposure and access to the East Coast companies because there's so much popping up in Alberta. And I'm really lucky being in Alberta to have that access. Yeah, you know, Primo, uh, so we've been licensed since 2021, but uh, it's funny. So our roots, we come back from the legacy market. Like my background is uh, medical cannabis. I had a um, MMAR license since I was 19 years old. And, uh, you know, my family and I, we, we were part of that Gold Star team going up against, well, Health Health Canada with Judge Fenlon on, uh, you know, I, it's because at the time it was uh, Stephen Harper. And Leona Gluca, they wanted to do the uh, MMPR, and that was to get rid of patients' ability to grow their own plants. So we were part of that whole process of trying to stand up, you know, for patients' rights and make sure that everybody has that opportunity to continue to grow their own plants. So when we came into the market, you know, the rec market now, 2021, we just kind of kept doing what we've always been doing. And, but we're, we're, you know, we've never really been on this top of the rooftop screaming out our name and stuff. So it's only now that uh, we're starting to launch with OCS uh, in June with a couple flowers that I'm starting to get out and meet with everybody again. And, and you know, a lot of people are asking us like, oh, are you guys new? And I said, well, no, we've, we've been licensed for a couple of years. It's just we keep it in house. We keep it quiet. You know, we, I, the couple of years we've just been trying to perfect our craft, uh, moving up from the medicinal side, now moving up to more of a commercialized craft, uh, you know, size. Well, it seems like for smaller producers that medical to legal is the a more affordable way to get your get your brand in the market, and b get your cultiv cultivars that are really popular dialed in so that when you're coming to market, you've got a half a dozen ready to go. Because if you're coming to the market with one or two genetics, you're not going to last that long unless you've got other stuff coming right behind it. Well, you know, that's that's one of the things with the industry today. I've noticed it's it's like an ice cream parlor shop. People want to go in. They really like vanilla. They really like chocolate. But when they come in again, you know, they're they're on to the next best thing. Right. So it's all about flavors. And and that's one of the benefits too. like as much as, you know, for as a as a craft producer on our side. Yeah, you, you, you know, it sucks the way that the uh, the foundation is set up that you have your G10 your product, your SKU, it's related. That's your horse. That's who you're riding with. Um, but in reality, it's exactly like I said, everybody wants the next thing. They want to try out different flavors. And and that's one of the benefits, I think, of legalization is that people are able to try out so many different flavors from all across Canada. And I think it's a great thing. But I, like you said, if you start off with one or two SKUs, you better have the next ones coming in behind. Unfortunately for us, like I started off with seven or eight different SKUs. We, like first thing we did was we wanted to phenol hunt, right? We popped a whole bunch of beans. We thought, okay, let's do this. And then when we went to the provinces, well, we got met with, well, we don't know who you guys are. You're craft, you're small. Uh, you could start off with two SKUs, uh, two different flower strains. That's it. And let's see how you do. Yeah, the provinces got burnt too many times too early. And it's yep. and it's not this and what's sad is it was one or two smaller companies that had a backlog of product. Like it seemed like they were prepping, brought it to market, and then it just didn't go very well. So now it's skewed that entrance style for anybody else, unless they've yep. got some sort of name or brand recognition, right? You're over yep, at the OCS. Exactly. You're over at the OCS, you're selling out. You come to Alberta and go, hey. I want to bring my products here. Alberta looks at OCS and goes, okay, yeah, you can bring all six SKUs because if they're moving in OCS, they're going to move in AJLC. At the yeah. very least, and you know what, to, to, Edmonton, to, Red Deer, and the, the major hubs. To be fair, AJLC, they're actually really good in terms of accepting 
uh, more than one type of flower product and skew. Like, uh, you know, we've, we've dealt with AGLC. They're actually really good over there. Um, it's some of the other provinces there, they like, they don't know you just yet. Like you said, you don't have that brand recognition or that history, especially being new and craft. You know, they don't know how you're going to do. You could tell them, hey, listen, I, I produce really good fire flour. Like, you know, my stuff is hand trimmed, hang dried. You know, we do craft. <laughs> That's great. Everybody's going to get in the same sales pitch. So they don't know who you actually are, all they're going to base it off is we'll give you a shot and that's a, a toe in the water, you know? Well, exactly. It's not it's not a merit-based system to enter into the OCS or the AGLC. It's not like they have, re which realistically they could, a handful of co subcontractors that get a box of product and go, should this come to our legal market? Yes or no. You don't find out what it is. You just literally get, here's the THC percentage, here's the terpene percentage, and then you give us a yes or no on these numbered bags. Should this that's come a really, the market? That's a really interesting way that I think, you know, like uh, in all fairness and transparency, like you said, then there's no uh, swaying about, yeah, brand recognition is great. But at the end of the day, you could have great brand recognition. But if your product is subpar and there's other product that's going to be able to fill the void in the market easier and better. Well, that's a great way to be able to do it. Right. Uh, there's no way to have some sort of. Uh, predisposition to sway you because you really like that brand at the end of the day that's just looking at the merit of the flower yeah and like i i'm just i'm getting to the point where it's like we need to provide the government a literally brain dumb like the simplest of solutions and hand them to hand them the people to do the work for it for it to ever be implemented because they're not going to spend the money and put the work in themselves we need to literally mm -hmm. give them the platform for them to go, oh, this will work, and just start. Yeah, you know what? Part part of that, like I agree. Part of it too is that the government is still learning. You yeah. know, a lot of them who who have been in here, like I've had inspectors from Health Canada. Their their backgrounds are in food. You know, like it's the same. It's the same type of deal. A lot of these uh, government officials who are looking after the programs, their background really isn't in cannabis because to them, before twenty eighteen. It was like, you know, huge stigma, uh, you know, if they did, if they did try cannabis before then it's never mentioned, you know, so uh, being, being part of the industry for such a long time, there's a lot that we have to offer. And it's the same with everybody. It's just as willing, if the government is willing to listen. And I think from what I've been seeing is that there's been some really good changes, changes happening um, on all levels with government in terms of cannabis. So We'll see what we'll see what happens. It's just whether or not, like you said, bringing those ideas to them if they're going to accept them and implement them. Yeah, and that's and the biggest thing is having a general idea, bringing it being brought to the government, going, "Hey, we should fix this." Yeah, we should. How? If you come with, uh, "We should fix this," and this is how we should try and do it, then at least they can start having the conversation about how, so that the mindset yep. changed from "We should" to "We are." Because if the conversation is happening, even though change may not be actively in process, it's being discussed, which is the first step to being put into process. It's like the beverages. they Those were two years of conversation and irritation to the government. Yep. That then we saw the change. That, that's exactly it. You know, and, and it's, basically, you know what? It's at least it's letting them know that there's an issue, even if you don't have the, the exact answer for, you know, I could give you a couple examples. Uh, the annual regulatory fees. Okay. That's a, the consumer might not be able to relate to this, but for us as producers, you have an annual regulatory fee that goes out to Health Canada that lets them recoup some of the costs of doing uh, regulatory oversight. So inspections, reviewing your monthly reports, all, any, any, anything to do with the regulation of cannabis on the production side. So the way that it works is that. You know, if you sell over a million dollars worth of product, you owe 2.3 percent back to the government. And that's for them to recoup some costs. If you don't sell a million dollars, it's twenty three thousand dollars flat. So that's the same for the craft small guys all the way up to the huge, huge mega, you know, like the, the mega, uh, you know, commercialized producers, the LPs, like the really, really big guys. They pay the same fee, the same rate. And. We, so we got licensed March 12th, 2021. We paid our, our $23,000 fee because you have no choice to pay it or you lose your license. 
So we paid the fee. Everything was great. We're ready to roll. And uh, come the next month, April 1st, I get a bill from Health Canada again saying, Here's, oh, you owe us 23 grand. And I said, well, hold on. No, no. The, I see here the check got uh, deposited. Everything's good. What's going on? They said, well, that $23,000, uh, it's for your entry year. And your entry year is from the date you're licensed to our fiscal year end, which is April 1st. <laughs> so we end, we end up getting billed $23,000 for 17 days, you know, or 18 days, uh, you know, and then it had to get recapped back over. So I had mentioned some of this to Health Canada and, you know, they said they're, they're working on that. And I also said, you know, realistically, the craft guys have one room, two rooms, three rooms. They don't have 60 rooms like the big, you know, huge corporations that are out there. And for us to be shouldering the same, uh, you know, the same uh, burden as the other guys, you know, I said that really it should be kind of tiered. It should be based on your size, the amount of resources you're actually spending to regulate us then yeah, I, you know, it should be a representation of that, not just, you know, equal across the board. And so I don't have, I don't have an answer how to actually do that, you know, and so I just gave them a couple of suggestions, but it's that idea of just bringing up the issue to them so that, Hey, they could start brainstorming and maybe there'll be some change down the line, you know? Well, it, 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 that's exactly it. There needs to be tiering for the smaller the more micro the the craft because people that are running two rooms yeah they're getting a lot of flour out of two rooms but they don't have kind of the security flour of a second or third or fourth room that they're harvesting the week later to bring out to market to just stock to just like they don't have the the daily special stock of the ounces that go out there that don't sell all that great, but when there's nothing else in store, they sell because they're the only ounces there. Yeah, and you know, the way I had I had mentioned it to them, uh, you know, this was actually it was funny. I was at we did the Can Expo in Toronto uh, back in March. It was a great expo, you know. I think that was their first year doing that, so we had a booth there, and I had so many people from the industry come up. I had some some folks from Health Canada, the Innovation Sciences Division, came up, and they were asking, you know one of the best things that's been asked me by health Canada is, you know, what do you think we could improve on? What do you think, you know, uh, is some suggestions about how things are going in the industry. And so I, I brought up the annual regulatory fee to them. And I said, you know, let's be honest. A lot of the craft guys starting off for the first few years, you're not breaking over a million dollars in sales. And so to, you know, for the large companies that have hundreds of thousands of square feet and footage, you know, for uh, for production canopies, uh, well, you know, 2.3%, that's a drop of the bucket for them. But when you have a, a company, let's say in their first year, they break, you know, $100,000. Well, 23,000 of that goes back to the government. That's, a, that's 23%, not 2.3%. So that's a huge chunk in terms of... <laughs> you know, taking that money out of the pockets of the craft guys. Yeah. It literally incentivizes the monopoly of the cannabis industry. It, it exactly. incentivizes large corporate. And it, it, it's, it, it's the same. Like when you go and you look at the dispensaries, it's starting to seem like it's the same argument there. You see a lot of dispensaries transition from, uh, especially local dispensaries transition from once a week ordering to twice a month. For sure. Because the shipping fee is what's killing them. Yeah. So so you have an incentive for the stores, well, to slow slow your roll because you're getting killed by the shipping. And for the producers, well, you either got to go big or go home because the structure, you know, even the regulations themselves, they're tailored towards the commercialized end, right? Like even the language used. I was at the Niagara Falls Expo there on uh, Saturday, the 22nd of this month. And they asked me to go up and do a panel and do, you know, craft versus commercial. So one of the things I was telling everybody at the panel was you have to listen to the language that's being used by the powers that be, you know, uh, even the term master grower. I said, you know, I told everybody I tell I tell I'll tell you guys. Yeah, I'm the head of cultivation because it's me, my father in law. We're a family run business here. You know, we're independent. We're family run. I've, I've got my family that grow with me. I'm listed for all intents and purposes as the master grower for Health Canada. I would never call myself a master grower, even though I've been growing for a long time. And 
you know, I tell everybody every time I do a grow, I run into a new problem because, and I always consider that a success because that means the old problems that I've had in the previous grows, I, you've overcome them. And that's that learning curve. But that whole language used of like master grower, you know, is something that right away it's the prestige and the title and real craft guys don't need that. They know they're just, they know their growers. They know their, their product is really great. You know, it's, it's fire. It's what's keeping the industry alive. You don't need that recognition. So I was telling everybody, you got to listen to the languages that are being used and the titles that are being used, because a lot of the people who started off in the industry in these massive corporations, they don't really have backgrounds in cannabis. They have pharmaceutical backgrounds, They've converted tomato farms. You're seeing a lot of them going under. And part of the reason is because they're not, it's a disconnect between the grower, the plant, the consumer, everything. There's a huge disconnect in there as you start to scale up. So I think being craft is that's one of the benefits is it's you who's growing it. Like I told everybody, Primo is my mom's maiden name. So I literally put my name on our product. I, I tell everybody, I, I'll go to the shows, you know, in Ontario, I go to the shops, like it's, it's us who grow it. It's us who are here, you know, representing it. Whereas I think there's a bit of a disconnect with the commercialized guys that, you know, who's growing it really is just, you know, they're just an employee there. There's that's somebody's day job or for us, it's a lifestyle. Oh, exactly. And any of the, the smaller facilities where it's been that kind of, that I've like really enjoyed being at are ones where you walk in and everyone's ex like, it doesn't matter who's walking through the door. They're excited. Like I'm walking through with yep. the owner and they're just as excited to see him as they are to see somebody else. It's like, For Oh, sure. he's not a boss. He's a coworker here. He puts in yep. just as much work as the rest of them, but he's just doing the phone calls and the emails instead of actually in the plants for the majority of the time. But yeah, and that's that's just be, that's much because necessary work. There's that connection there between the person who's operating and what they're actually doing. They have a passion for it, and that's a huge difference between the commercial and the craft. You have a passion; it's a lifestyle. You live by it. Like I said, I I've been with the the MMAR. I still have my injunction papers. Like you know, I I've, I've watched the way that Canada's legalization has happened. You know, I've seen certain family members try and push, you know, all my life for uh, decriminalization. While we went legalization, I've seen it go from the MMAR to the MMPR to the ACMPR to the Cannabis Act. I've watched the players that are in it. And now it's kind of just the way that the market's shifting towards, hey, craft is the way to go. It's it's premium flour. It's, you know, you, you can taste and smoke and burn that passion, you know, that the growers have. That I'm starting to see that you know we have an we have an area in the market that we're we're able to enter now. So with, this is why I'm saying that it's kind of our time now to be able to step forward. Oh, absolutely, and I, especially the way that I I'd say just since COVID's opened up the the market in the sense of having events and having people discuss. So in the last six to nine months, heavily the focus to craft cannabis and top quality product has been just everybody's focus because people are coming out and sharing the jars they're giving for sure and ex here smell this this is something that's killer out in alberta when i was out in ontario i was with partake i brought them out they're a craft producer two root two flower rooms and a bedroom so super small facility they're growing yep. some killer stuff brought it out yep as soon as i brought that out everyone else reached right into the bottom of their bag to pull out their best jar to go, oh, let's share this. We're we're looking at the good stuff. We're not just, oh, what are we smoking on today to kind of burn through our bulk weed because we're at a event, right? Yeah, you know what? It's so funny you say that because I so I've been to the the Can Expo, like I was saying, great expo, but it was missing it was missing that culture vibe that I used to go to the shows, like treating yourself, and I used to love going to shows. And like you said, it used to be about sharing in the strains sharing in, you know, this is the new flower. You got to try this, this, you know, and, and that experience of interacting and seeing what's new and smelling those terpenes and looking at the flower and trying it, burning it, seeing if it's a white ash and how it is, that is a cultural thing, yep. you know? And so I think a lot of that is missing when you go to uh, 
you go to some of these larger shows and you're like, ah, it's like a dance party, a high school dance party. And like mom and dad are in the corner of the room, you know, and nobody's into it about sharing their genetics or sharing, you know, uh, and that's how it really, like, if you think about it back in the day, everybody was sharing, like, that's how uh, the strains that are around today are the ones from the legacy market that have been shared and have been elevated by being crossed and, and developed from there. Right. It was all about the genetics back in the day. And so it's funny, they said about pulling out those jars, right? Because that's that whole thing where you, you get to actually experience and share and be part of that culture. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I've been lucky enough that through the creation of my content, the reviews, I've become to be known as someone to, oh, we should go and show our cool shit to. Yeah, so I, yeah. get, I get lucky enough to have people come to me, but how quickly the circle develops once people see that's what's going on. Like it goes from me and one other person to there's a dozen of us in about four minutes before I even get yeah. through the third jar because people are like, oh, the real session's over there and they just flock and then everyone's got jars out and we're all, and then the amount of times I saw the smoke pit go from nothing to everything and grow up because of that. Or even when I was out in Vancouver, a couple of times at lift had that happened where we just started pulling home, grow out and started sharing. Everyone's rolling up their bulk weed that it's like, Oh, if this goes yep. around the circle, I'm not that worried about it. They've got their good stuff in the bag in case, but it's not what's rolled up and ready to smoke. I don't ever roll my good stuff. That's ready to smoke. If I'm going to smoke it, it's like, here, Look at the bud. You hang on to it while I get my grinder and tray out. It's the whole experience. From That's it. Pulling the it's jar. That in, it's that interactive experience, being able to hold the jar, see the bud, smell the terps, you know, look at look at the flavonoids in it. What color what colors are, you know, like what the traits are, everything. You know, it's no longer just considered a product, right? It's a flower. You're appreciating it and you're appreciating the grower. Exactly. It's it's and my biggest thing is when customers were coming to the shop, one of my first questions, especially with customers that I knew were just there to get high was, are you looking for an experience? Or are you looking to get high? Yeah, I will exactly. differ the product for you. And they, that is so funny. And it's you know what? Uh, it's part the of, of times they change and all of a sudden they come back and they just go, well, I want an experience because they understand sure. the difference. For sure. And you know, I think part of that too, is that whole education and the government's kind of they've actually enabled the opposite of this but th it's that education of that it's not about the thc you want to go get high great you know like knock knock yourself out it's like the the whole push of like you know the higher the thc the better the product yeah there's there's you know great product with high thc there's excellent product as well with lower thc it you know we're now looking at people are starting to pay attention to the terps right? What's the terpenes? What's, you know, what are you going to experience when you have this flower? What, you know, if it's a dried flower product, I, I, you know, what are you going to smell? What does it look like? What does it feel? All of these things, you know, are play a factor rather than, Hey, is it 28% THC or not? You know, because that's all that I'm shopping for this dollar rate for this THC. Whereas, you know, that takes away from the flower, the attributes of it. So, you know, that's that whole experience. You don't get to actually really appreciate and experience the flower when you look at it just as a method to get high. You know, just give, give me something to get high, quickest bang for my buck. Some people shop like that. There's nothing hey, like whatever floats your boat. I just think that a lot of people end up missing out that it's not just about the THC. It's about how it was grown. How does it burn? What's the what's the flavor? What's the smell? You know, uh, diving into even just the lineage of the genetic, you know, like, where does it come from? How did it come to be? You know, who grew this? All of these things are really important, you know, when you factor in about experiencing smoke. Well, I've, absolutely. And that's that's why I, when I was bud tending, I got just to that point where I was just asking it straight out. Because you ask somebody that a half a dozen times. Yep. A at a certain point, they're going to go, what the fuck do you mean an experience? <laughs> what yeah. do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm irritated. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Well, okay, and that's let that, me, let that's me take that education. A hundred percent. You're doing the exact right thing. Do you want to have an experience? That's that whole education where they're like, what are you talking about? An experience. 
And and honestly, nine times out of ten, it was the half a dozen to the dozenth time that I said that that someone would get literally irritated and go, "What do you mean?" <laughs> And that that irritation is the their cue. The brain's open. You have an opportunity. You, may, you want to make sure you can hit that story on the head. And it, you watch what they buy, and you try and get something close to it, so that it's that not a so big funny. sell. It's a here. Just take one step over to the right. Spend an extra three dollars here, but you're going to get this, this, and this. Tell me which of these three things you find, and then we'll find something that you like even more. We're not going to jump you to the biggest thing. We're going to jump you to the next step. We're going to take you on an experience to find the product you like the most. So now they're involved in the decision. You're not just going buy this. It's it, telling it, a story is what a, it is. A hundred percent. It tells the story. And also it is training. It, it's education. It's, it's guiding. It's no longer selling. You know, you're not on a sales pitch. It's fun, like, you know, when I go to these expos, I'm trying to tell people, you know, our big thing right now, we launched June 1st. With OCS, we have uh, two strains. I got my lava cake, which is a great pie, thin mint cookie, Canarado genetic. Nice. And then we crossed it in-house. Uh, we crossed it with Samoa's, which is a forum cut, face-off kush, cookies again, which then we called the dough. So I've got both these strains that are launching with OCS June 1st. Obviously, I'd like everybody to know about it because, you know, we want to have a successful launch. When I go to these expos and we have a booth and people come up and they want to know who we are and what, you know, what's the lava and what's the dough, I, I really don't even tell them, hey, uh, you know, this is the cell, you know, like here we do this, we hand trim, we hand package, we hang dry. All of that stuff comes out organically after. The first thing I tell people is, you know, Primo, we're independent, we're family run, we're craft business. These are the two strains. I lead with the jar. Here's the smell. Here's the terps. People look at them. They experience. They interact. I invite them on the journey rather than sit there and try and give you the sales pitch and hopefully you walk away. I'd rather just shoot the shit with people and talk with them and say, hey, listen, this is who we are. My background's in medical. We were in legacy. We're now over here on this side. This is what we're producing. You know, smell it. Tell me what you think. You know, like hopefully you guys like it. You know, how's your day today? And just I keep it on a personal level rather than that sales pitch. And it's the same type of thing that you're mentioning with the bud tender is that you're, you're, you're kind of fishing that brain to, you know, of the consumer so that, Hey, what do you mean experience? You know, like that irritation. Well, what I mean is, you know, here, try, try out this flowers. Tell me what all these attributes, like, you know, truly experience it. Right. And it's no longer a sales pitch. It's more of a guidance. Well, exactly. And and going like, the amount of times where it was just like you're buying the the cheap six dollar pre-roll just to get you through. And that you yeah. then you hear me ask that to somebody else who comes in and that stops the customer who just bought that pre-roll and go, Well, what do you mean? How can I can I experience it with what I just bought here? And they give a snarky remark and I go, Well, yeah, you just take your time and you do it like this. And then all of a sudden they come back 25 minutes later, higher than they've they could have imagined being and they look like <laughs> you were fucking right like <laughs> cannabis is a take your time kind of a consumption you know what it, it that's how you get that high school high that you, you know from back in the day the first times you used to smoke it's because you know you're you're taking your time with that consumption think about the first time you probably ever got high blazing well you took your time with it you didn't just like you know puff the joint and run off, you know, like you used to, nobody was rolling your joints back then either. You would roll your own, you know, like you had that whole experience. First, you would see what's going on with the flower, process it yourself into that joint. And then when you go to try it, it was a, it was an experience, right? It was a cultural thing. Like everybody got to, to, to hang out if you're not by yourself, you know, like it was a social thing. And that's why I think a lot of people got so, so stoned back then is because they were truly experiencing it, right? It wasn't like today where it's a product that's just going to get you through, you know, uh, the next couple hours. Well, that's, and that's, that's something that I never, I never understood because like I consume heavily medically for my, from my injury, from mental health support and my back. Yeah. But I don't understand how people can go, well, I just don't get high anymore. Like I can still get just as high as I did in the beginning, 
But what I do is it just takes a little more effort on my side. So I have to make sure I'm sitting in an environment that doesn't have distractions. I've got a little bit of music on if I want it. I yeah, smoke yeah. and then I sit down and I fully embrace the experience. I wait and I let the high wash over me and I look for everything in it. Then guess what? I open my eyes after five minutes. I am blasted. And I can let that <laughs> yeah, last yeah. as long as I sit in that almost kind of meditative state. Then I get up and I start functioning like it, like I normally do. And I can smoke throughout the day. But I switch genetics. I can find that same experience by doing the same thing. Sitting down, taking 20 minutes to enjoy myself, get that heavy high, and then go about my day. It's funny because, you know, you mentioned meditation. Cannabis and meditation, they go hand in hand. And that's that whole, you know, keeping an open mind frame, enjoying the moment. All of those things are going to affect that experience that you're talking about. Right. So f for me, yeah, I, I'm all about people just being able to socialize, ha you know, keep that culture alive that I, I've experienced my whole life is that it's a cultural social thing. You know, you'll know it. You'll know it when you're in it, you know, like you go there and you realize, hey, these are just people who who you know the general community who who consumes cannabis and stuff from that you know legacy side and the medical side from before the cannabis act it's a very you know everybody's so well mannered and so nice and they just want to share they're just excited you know about what they created and that creativity you could that positive energy you could feel it it oozes out of people you know so i really like that i like to think that that's going to continue on you know on this side of things and I, I, you know, everybody I've met so far, we've just been thriving off of the positivity. You know, the community is so tight knit. You start meeting one person and you realize that you're friends with 10 other people. You know, you have mutual friends and everybody's uh, has been phenomenal so far. You know, that's why I love going out to these expos and going out and meeting with, uh, you know, bud tenders and, and retailers and consumers in general is because I really enjoy the scene, you know, like it's it's a lifestyle. Well, exactly. And it it seems like we're getting that very clear differentiation between the people who are passionate and want to see this industry thrive and really expand, showing up to these events regularly, flying across the country to hit these events when and if they can afford it. Um, and just sure. really as present as possible, because I've seen the same dozen people at every event I've been to in the last nine months. And I fully expect to see them in the next three that I'm going to be at over the next couple of months as well, because the life, the lifeblood, they're the lifeblood of the industry. It's the people who always show up. You basically yeah. know you're going to run into this person because they truly have a passion for it. You know, they, they love it. It's not, it's not a job. It's not a career. It's, it's something that, you know, whether, whether the cannabis act would be here or not, these people would be doing the same thing. Like they, they have a true passion for flower and for the plant and for the lifestyle. Well, exactly. It's a little bit of their lifeblood in a sense. It, uh, it, absolutely. It, it gives them drive. Yeah, absolutely. I'm one of those people. I, I am absolutely one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I show up no, I, pit half I'm, hour early and I close the night out at the after parties. If there's a smoke pit, like yeah. nowhere to find me. It's it's funny the after parties. So I got I got a nine month old at home now, and my wife's like, "Hey, listen, you know, go in, say hi, do whatever, and then you know, get your ass back home." <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's been a little bit of a delicate work life balance in terms of going to the after parties because the after parties are great. You get to meet people who are like, you know, they're the real deals. You know what I mean? Like they're the people who you're genuinely happy to see, and you can talk and be yourself. You know, and like I said, the expos are great. I, I enjoy being part of the expos. I enjoy meeting and talking to people. But a lot of it is, like I said, it's a, a high school party with mom and dad in the corner. Whereas you go to the after parties and it's just the the people, you know, like yeah. it's, you know, it's the after party. Mom and dad have gone to bed. It's it's a, it's an area to be able to interact socially and, and just be there. And everybody, you'll notice at these after parties, they're just super like oozing with good vibes and, and positivity and they're just excited to show you what they have 
Yep. And that that's why I like the smoke pit too, because it's almost like you're out in the backyard and mom's looking through the kitchen window. You can get away <laughs> with some shit that you can't get away with in the house. Yeah, ex- the smoke exactly. pit is, a, is an interesting area to hang out with. <laughs> the smoke pit was always the best place to hang out, you know, because like you said, you can't get away with everything, but you know, at least you're outside. <laughs> there, there's some joints being handed, just walked by, slipped into the hands. There's some people there that you told you could tell they paid a couple of people off in their day. They could slide oh, yeah. things into into your hand without you even noticing it. That's so funny. <laughs> but, oh yeah, you know what? I, you I'm couldn't really have happy. a better experience in the cannabis industry than stuff like that. That's exactly what you want. Oh, for sure, for sure, because that's that's the way that it happened organically for years. You know, like yeah, Trevor, I'm I'm just super happy, man, that we were able to come on and. And, you know, shoot the shit a little bit about Primo and, you know, just with the culture and the lifestyle, like having an outlet like this for the craft guys, it means a lot. Oh, absolutely. And this is the type of conversation that I feel should be had in the industry because there's not opportunity for people to see that, oh, the master grower, the lead grower, the QA person is just another pothead like me. Oh, yeah. Well, I can approach him at an event and just ask him about this, right? And 100%. That's, that, and that's what I want people to do with me too, is if you have a genetic that's really impressing you, just come up, tap me on the shoulder and give me the jar and go, hey, what do you think of this? I will crack yeah. it open, take a look and give you my opinion and ask yours because I'm more interested in what you have to say than what I have to say. I know what I'm going to say with 90% of the genetics on the market because I've smoked a lot of genetics on the market. Yeah. <laughs> I've got predisposed yeah. opinions on a lot of stuff. But I'm interested to hear what you have to break down, because you might say one describing term that I never thought of before that all of a sudden I can start using again. Oh, it's so funny you say that, because I've been meeting so many bud tenders and being able to provide them with a chance to check out the flower, you know, and review it. And then I get these reviews back, and I just absolutely it's the best part of my day you know i get to meet people who are actual real people in the industry that are so passionate about what they do like the bud tenders i can't say you know enough about them like they're so good everybody that i've met they're just got such a passion and then when they get to interact with the flower and you know when it's your own tray of cookies you know you're you're your own worst critic you don't know how anyone else is going to take it and so when you get that little bit of positivity back it really stokes the flame inside, you know, like I've been seeing so many positive reviews, people tagging me and they're just so happy. The flower, listen, the flower was awesome. They can't wait. It was an educational experience. This is, you know, this is even improvements. How, listen, I I noticed this, all of these things, it really stokes that inner flame for me anyways, being a craft guy, because I take it to heart. I like, you know, like I said, I made, I got all the ingredients. I made up the batter. I made up the cookies. I baked them. I, you know, I, I put them on the tray. Like it's, it's me on that plate. You know, it's uh, my heart and soul. It's not uh, just a product, you know, that I'm looking to generate income to pay off shareholders that, you know, have nothing to do with cannabis. And it's just a, a revenue stream for them. For me, it's, it's a lifestyle thing. I, I really thrive off of getting that feedback from people and saying, Hey, I, I really enjoyed this. It had this type of flavor and this type of taste. And for everybody, you know, it's the same thing, like with everybody's eyes. So everybody sees a different shade of color, you know, like my red is not your red. And so to get that feedback of like, this is what they're tasting and this is what they're smelling and this is how they felt in their experience. It's so valuable. And I, I I just really appreciate everybody, you know, uh, giving that type of feedback. Yeah, and that that type of feedback and that type of interaction that you're describing is actually reminding me a lot of what uh, Smoker Farms, Jeff and Sherry have been receiving lately when they started Wicked. getting online and starting to create um, some of their content. They were the feedback that they get from their consumers is huge. So, like craft producers that are look that are getting similar feedback, that's always great to hear that each kind of local hub has got their kind of craft producer that's doing incredibly well, or that's getting really well known. And it's for sure. And and you know, it's, it's the same for all all craft producers. When you get that feedback, a hundred percent, you feel tickled inside, you know, you get that flame stoked 
you, you know, you get fired up. It's you get a bit of even of an adrenaline rush because it's you. It's an extension of yourself. You're like what I produce. I always feel like it's an extension of myself. I'm proud. I'm happy. I'm you know. I'm I'm just positive when I hear somebody really likes our flower. Somebody had a great experience. That to me, it, you know, I get that high off of that. You know, as funny as it sounds, I I really do, and I'm sure it's the same for the other craft producers because it's their heart and soul put out there. Well, that's exactly it, and especially if you're bringing genetics that you've crossed yourself and and you've taken the time to hunt out. It's a totally different um, for sure. experience than people who are just hunting seeds, right? For sure, and- you you know what? So our breeder that I use in house awesome guy brent is from function genetics just huge shout out to him man he's such a old school awesome geneticist so he does all of our breeding with us it's phenomenal he's the one who created the dough i always tell him like it's your baby i'm just raising it you know like at the end of the day i'm just the grower you know it's your baby like you crossed it you know we did the pheno hunting we you know that is one of the most exciting parts of growing for me because that's what we used to do back in the day. You know, like you couldn't buy a, a monopolized cut that, you know, like y- you'd have to find your mother plant in order to do that. Well, you need to pop your beans. You need to do the pheno hunt. And that was one of the most exciting grows we've done so far, you know, as Primo was the first two grows we did. We we're like, let's pheno hunt. And when we found the dough, you know, I did like the dough A to Z, you know, we had the dough version A, the dough version B. When we found that one that we wanted, we narrowed it right down. That was like, that's our baby. That's, you know, like it really is more than just the, even that sense of like, I made the cookies, I put them out there. Like, you know, that's like you farmed the wheat and, and then made it into flour. And, you know, like it just yeah. takes that extra step that you're really, you know, that's really a part of you and something that you're super proud to do. So I, I always love giving Brent, you know, uh, uh, just, hey, man, that's you. You did that. You know, because at the end of the day, it's a lot of work. Pheno hunting, you know, like it's a lot of work because you have to have that drive and passion to keep up with it because you want to see that plant, that particular strain, that particular pheno, you want to see it elevated to its maximum. You want to put the best on the table. Oh, absolutely. And I like I'm quite literally in stage one of that process where I'm trying to hunt my mothers to then start getting good genetics to cross with. So I'm barely scraping the surface of that work and it's already a lot of work because i've got full 20 different genetics on the go right now that i'm trying to find something worthwhile keeping wicked let's hear let's hear some of the genetics so i've got a granddaddy purple crossed with a juicy zane which is what i'm running as a part of a grow comp petition that i've got with my discord channel um nice and then i just dropped uh, five GMO sour dubbed crossed with Wilson. Now Ooh. Wilson's uh papaya crossed with a banana OG. That that cut was crossed with the uh, Tropicana cookies. So that's uh that's Omni's cookies. So that it's from uh that one's Masonic Genetics. Is that Wilson? Okay. Okay. So yep. I'm really interested to. See, I'm hoping I can find a papaya dominant, um Wilson within that GMO sour dub too, because if I could find that, that would be an absolute gem in the rough. Well, uh, and that's that, that's that whole excitement, you know, like I know. Okay. So because we're launching with the lava cake in the dough, well, that's what we produce now, you know, like we're producing lava cake dough. I've grown it now. I know what to expect. You know, like, like I said, every grow, let's not kid ourselves. You're always going to run into haste. So, a new problem came up. And, you know, it's a way for you to learn and grow. You never have a new problem. You're never going to grow, right? And for me now, I know what to expect with them. So, I, you know, th- that's what, the, like, in my heart, I love pheno hunting because it's that surprise. You never know what you're going to get. You have the highest expectations that, you know, you're hoping it's even going to exceed that, you know. So it's a, it's a lot of work, but it's also, like, it's the most exciting work. Oh, exactly. And then it's exciting and heartbreaking at the same time because when you're dropping regular <laughs> seeds or you're dropping seeds and they don't germ especially when you paid a pretty penny for them because i got two canarado packs that are sitting in my drawer that are not going to get touched until i've really dialed things in <laughs> canarado is is who we fuck with huge man oh. like 
like my lava cake is a Canarado lava cake. Like that's Canarado, you know, I'm, and uh, I saw some of their gear. So and good. Like, I, I became a fanboy. I can't remember what it was. It was one. I think I, actually it was the Garlissimo. The Garlissimo was the first flower I saw pictures of from there. And I just yeah. immediately became a fanboy. And then I you was know what? In- I, his great pie lineage is just so good. Oh. The Sunday driver, you know, the biscottis, you know, like I was, ma- I made sure like I got some new beans. We're going to be popping up this week to get started because like you said, the lava cake and the dough, I love them. You know, like I, I, ha- I put my name on them, but I know it's only a matter of time before we have to come out with the next, the next flower, you know, yeah. the next flavor. As you great as they're going to be, before people start asking, <laughs> that's it. So we're already going to be starting the new Fino hunt, and I straight up, I'm popping Canarado. I've got a Bundy that I'm ready to pop, and I've got uh, just trying to think here. I've got his biscotti line. I've got the grape, grape pie, biscotti. I've got Sunday Driver Cross biscotti, and I think the last one we were going to do is that peanut butter biscotti Sunday, and Maybe the Sunday with sprinkles. So no, all of those, all good. of those strains, I'm just so excited to just grow them out, mum them, get the next batch into, you know, run them through, find out which ones are great. Yeah, it's heartbreaking when certain ones don't pop and they cost a lot of money and everything else. But you got to break some eggs to make an omelet, you know. Oh, exactly. It's it's heartbreaking throwing the ones out that didn't turn while you're growing. But yes. as soon as you find that, as soon as you find that mum. It's a thousand percent worth it. So it's the tiny heartbreaks on the way to the celebration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I always say, you know, it's it's like uh, it's better to have loved and lost, you know, than never at all. You yeah. Know? And and in this case, the, the idea is is to, like you said, go through all the little heartbreaks to get up to the, you know, the, hey, look, this this was the love of my life. This is it here. Yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say, do you have any of their snowman crosses from Canarado? I wish I had function with me right now because he just would geek out on you hardcore right now. Like <laughs> I love bringing them to the shows with me because you get the, like the hardcore, you know, it's all about the lineage and Brent is right there, man. He's like, he, I always tell him like you geeking out on me, man, because he really just loves it. You know, like it's about the lineages. So I always, whenever I think about popping something new, he's like, listen, you should try this one. This is, you already have it in your seed bank. Just, you know, like this is what we should do. So speaking of like papayas, we've got, you know, and I, and I've ran this strain before and I don't know why I didn't keep the Fino. I, I probably should have, um, I had it, you know, before we got licensed, we had the medical licenses. I had ran banana papaya from Omni and it was so good. I used to call it like sour patch kids smell the sour patch Fino. Cause it was just so good. So I actually told him, like, I'd love to reboot that, you know, and, and sort through those because that Sour Patch kid smell from that banana papaya was like, it was so good. I bet you it is the Omni's banana papaya then that I, cause I remember watching a video and he, Masonic was t- saying he fucked with Omni. So I would make yep. perfect sense if it was th- their banana papaya and a trop cookies that he then found the Wilson and took it as his. Well, I'm pretty sure the trop cookies too. I could be wrong. And like I said, I'm probably going to get eggs thrown at me at the next party by like, you know, the hardcore lineage guys. But oh. trop, trop cookies to me is Omni. Yeah. So that, that would make sense if he said, because I remember it. I, I, and I could be wrong too. And I know I get corrected regularly, but I, that would make sense. I could be, yeah. it. <laughs> that's that. That, that it, Wilson that I've got could be killing. That Wilson is fire, man. I'm going to tell oh. you right now, like when, if you cross that and you find a, a, like a really nice Fino, that's got a good blend of both of those. That is going to be really nice flower. Well, I've got, the, it's the GMO sour dub crossed with the Wilson is what I've got. Yeah. So that's, Unbelievable. that's going to be, if I can find one that's got the gas and the fruit, that'll be a mind melt for sure. Oh, yeah, that's, that's funny. That, you know, that, the one I'm also really excited for that we're going to be popping is the Bundy. That should be, you know, good. you know, he got that serial killer cut. So, it, you know, it's basically Fruity Pebbles OG cross animal mints. And then you've got his birthday cake, which is that cherry pie and Girl Scout cookies. So, or, you know, the Thin Mint cookies because everybody's getting, you know, <laughs> chased after for using Girl Scout. But yeah, 
our 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 lava cake, which is his lava cake for Tanerado, it's it's grape pie cross the cookies. And so the birthday cake being, you know, cherry pie cross the cookies, I'm just super excited to see, you know, what that turns out. If it's anything like our lava, if it has, you know, the, more of that cherry, cherry fino in it. And to hear that it's crossed with the fruity pebbles and the mints, that's that's one that I'm really looking out for. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. Uh, I just me, I hate, I, you know, I hate the name Bundy because it's a serial killer name, you know, and I'd hate the name of strain. But again, like you, you, I, I'm not one to pr- like, you know, I really don't like when people take stuff from the legacy stuff and they switch the name up to meet the, you know, the market. At the end of the day, that's somebody's baby. You know, like they made that they named it. Like I told Brent, listen, from function, it's it's your cross, man. Like you you did it. What do you want to name it? And he wanted to name it the dough because it's the lava with twice the cookies, nice. you know. So again, Bundy. I guess I got no choice. That's what that's what the strain's name. I don't know how well it's going to go with you know, you know, Bundy's got a it's it's he's a serial killer. You know what I mean? Yeah. And well, and where where I come from is if you're going to do like you go you pheno hunt it, you find your own unique pheno, and you can put like a branded name on that pheno because it's really unique flavor and it goes along with that. But you put the cult of our name right below it. There's no, it. I, I have no issue with you finding, having a phenotypical name because that is your own work is phenotyping that. Like we've been to saying you are doing work phenotyping. For that sure. Plant. For but sure. Yeah. If you, if you want to name respect, the cut, yeah. Name the cut, whatever you want. It's your cut. You know, like you, you pheno hunted it, you found it, you got something unique, but the genetic, that's still, you know, hey, listen, that's still lava cake. That's still the dough, you know, like name the we used to call the lava cake the onion cut. Yeah. Because it's got a re, it smells sometimes to me like as if there's an old onion in the corner of the room, you know, in the cupboard. When you open that cupboard door, you get that real funk earth smell. That was the lava cake to me. Some other people smell coffee, they smell grapes, they smell, you know, chocolate, red wine. Everyone's got a different nose. But like you said, Name it whatever you want. You did a lot of work to Fino Hunt, but just make sure you put that cultivar name, you know, and give respect to the growers. And if you can find a way to incorporate the cultivar name into your phenotypical name, well, that's even one better. Right? 100%. 100%. So, like, I look at it where I can respect the marketing side and having to have unique names to try and catch people's eyes. That makes perfect sense. However, on that bag, you need to tell people what the basic cultivar is so that at least the people who like me or you that would look at that and go, yeah, probably won't touch it because I'm not a huge fan of that terpene profile. Looks great. Smells great. Not something I should smoke, though, because it's yeah. going to give me a headache or it's going to give me this. That, that not, is just... not only that, but not only that, but, you know, how does how does the breeder get recognition? Yep. If everyone's just going to take their, you know, take their baby, put their own name on it. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, that breeder worked hard as much as pheno hunting's hard. Like you said, you just scratching the surface of crossing, you know, and going through that whole thing. And that's a lot of work. You, you have to really nurse nurse. It's really a nursery. You have to really nurse those plants and nurse everything up and, and be proud of what you created. And I think it's important for you know people to respect the breeders and that and the, their choice of what they name that strain, what they name that kid. That's you know that's to me important. So, absolutely, the, the respect needs to be fed back to the people who are creating the opportunity for you to be able to find that genetic. Because they didn't do the work, if they didn't f if they didn't take that to an F two, how much of a harder pheno hunt would it have been? Hundred percent. Let's just go from F ones to F twos. You're talking about thousand extra seeds to maybe find that pheno. Yep. <laughs> yep. Maybe and ten thousand. That's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, like, give them the respect where it's due. You know, and that's why I I always tell people when you know if if functions with me at the parties, hey, listen, this is the guy. You know. I'm just, I'm just, the, you know, he's, the, he's the parent. I'm just raising the kid, you know, in terms of the strain, because 
I always like giving him respect where it came to because that's his thing. That's his that's his uh, legacy, you know. Well, exactly. There's there's some people who are substantially better breeders than they are large flower room growers. Yep. But they're just as talented as the large flower room growers, if not more talented when it comes to genetic knowledge and having the ability to adapt their environment to what the plants need. Because hundred percent large room 100%. growers, they're protocol followers and resolution finders for kind of the problems that pop up within those protocols. It's a different style of growing and a different mentality is needed. One's not 100%. better than I mean, the other. Straight up, look at the tent grows. The the guys who are doing those tent grows and they're trying, you know, and they're doing a little bit of crossing and they're, you know, doing some breeding stuff. It doesn't have to be a major operation. Like, you know, just even the guys who are doing small tent grows and yep. stuff, they know every single inch of that tent. They know all the plants. They know them on such a personal level, even more so than I do. My room, our room's seventy eight one thousand watt lights. Not big in any means, you know. Like we pump out maybe 45 kilos four or five times a year, you know, depending if we ever our shit together. And even, even for us, like I, I know each plant, I know everything, but not as much as the guys in the tents because, you know, they're only dealing with so many plants, but they know them so well, you know, like, and there's, so there's nothing wrong with guys in tents can't do the, like the, the larger craft grows or the commercial grows they're still talented in such other ways, you know, like about breeding and, and knowing what they're looking for and everything to do with, you know, that whole uh, area of the industry, you know, they're super talented, none, none less than anybody else. Well, exactly. They're just talented in their area of expertise. For sure. And pulling them out of their area of expertise and trying to slam them into something else. It's not the right seat on the bus for them. Sometimes, <laughs> exactly. sometimes those all those amazing breeders are just better cultivar assistants, grow assistants, where all they do is they take care of two rooms, they put their headphones in, and they go and they do what they do at home in the rooms. Go and do the sure. top, the trim, their clones, the upkeep, the water, make sure everything's running s smooth, make sure the ha the plants are happy. They just spend time on plant. Because there's some growers who are like that. I'm one of those people. Put my headphones in and leave me the fuck alone. I'll be happy working with my plants. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. You know, it's funny. Like, uh, because we work family over here. You know, like, I know, I know who I'm working with. I know what I'm in for for the day. You know, yeah. and I honestly like we hand water every plant. So like, I'll I'll mix up whatever our newts are, get everything ready. pH is good. You know, and then I'll fire away, and I go in there and I have a hose and I hand water every plant. We used to do like six or 700 plants per batch, nothing major, you know, and uh, I like working by myself with my plants. I, I enjoy working with family, but I know what you mean about throwing in some headphones and you're just you're in the zone with the plants, you know, and and for me, I, I'm, I'm the weirdo who's listening to, you know, like I'm listening to the hum of the fans and everything. And I'm just in, you know, almost meditating as I'm actually watering. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'll go down. And like, just sit with my tent doors open and read a book, listening to that stuff. And yeah. when I'm working. <laughs> the music and stuff is what's nice because, and I'll if no one's in the area where I'm at, I'll just crank it because the plants like it too. It's been it's been noted. Plants like music for sure. And yeah, a hundred a hundred percent. I've caught I've caught my father in law singing singing to the plants in, the, in that room. Said, what are you doing? He goes, it's known. You know, they the plants really dig it. Well, like, I, 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 because tomatoes are actually relatively comparable to cannabis for a lot of the cultivation techniques, not directly, but comparable, we've got a neighbor who goes out and to increase the pollination on his tomatoes, he tickles them with a feather while he sings to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mom doesn't use a feather, but goes out and just with a, like a light glove, just kind of does similar things talk to the plant rubs them tomatoes have gotten four times the amount of production since starting to do that cannabis yeah. is much different it's the, they're living things you connect it's with them in some thing. way shape or form that's what i mean like that's that whole thing where you know the commercial the commercial versus the craft guys commercial it's a product it's a way to make revenue you know like bang it out this is what it is it's it's uh it's very it's almost cold it's like uh it's number stock 
yeah, it's number stock. Whereas, you know, like, like you said, that's that whole craft cultural thing is that it's living plants. It's living beings. You're surrounded by life. It's a cultural thing. Like you, you have such an appreciation for what you're doing and, you know, and the respect as well for that, that it's a living being that you're working with here, you know, well, and it, it exactly. goes a long ways. And, and <laughs> at no point do anybody in the industry shit on who's growing for those large corporations because they feel the same way we do. The only difference sure. is they have to deal with the restrictions of that company. So they hurt a little bit more than I do because they physically are restrained by it. I know, know. that's, the, that's the worst. That's part. Like worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're actually hurting, you know, like they probably come in with that passion and that, that respect. And then they get that limitations put on them and that, that would hurt more than, you know, on our end, because you want to do it. You know what I mean? Like you want to have that appreciation and that respect. And, you know, you want to bring something, you know, that bring that fire, like I said, in your belly out and uh, you're getting suppressed. Exactly. It's, and it's, it, it's, it's a, a bottleneck in this industry that I, you can start to see breaking out because there's a starting to become more, avenues for the craft producers to pop up and you guys are just starting to be a little bit more loud in overall like you're realizing that making noise is going to benefit you a lot and that people are actually listening and looking for that style of information and like i know in alberta sampling is going to open up huge opportunity for um the smaller companies because they're going to be able to go oh yeah the tweed rep was just in here he gave you guys some products let me give you guys some too. And you can look at it. Apple stops. Yep. Yep. You know, that opens up a huge thing because like I said too, it's the same type of thing as, as even just being on this podcast, it's those uh, avenues to be able to reach out, you know, like for, for, for anybody you launch with AGLC, you're one in 6,000 products, yep. you know, like how do you get your name out? If you're craft and you're smaller and you, and if you're family business, if you're restricted budget, you know, all of these things, how do you get that same market share? Well, frankly, you don't. The only way that it can kind of even the playing field is now you can provide samples. You can show the bud tender, hey, listen, this is my product. You want to compare it apples to apples? You know, like you could do that. Like check it out. You know, like you have that experience interacting with the flower rather than having someone come and give you that sales pitch. Yep. And how much more confident is the bud tender going to be able to go, oh, yeah, that actually tasted like they're describing it. I, I got to smoke it. One of the reps came in and he was, we were lucky enough to be able to get a sample. Now all of a sudden the bud tender is naturally telling their story and the customer goes, Oh, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. If it caught your attention that much where you're going to tell me a story. Well, shit, extra $3 than what I was looking at before. Same percentage. Sure. Let's try it out. Yeah. You know what? It's uh, by allowing people to experience the flower, you know, in, in terms of sampling, like the bud tenders, that's a big thing. And it'd be happening with AGLCs allowing that now um, by allowing them to do that, you get to invite them on the journey. And then it changes the perception of the brand, you know, like for example, they could end up going, Hey, listen, I tried out Primo stuff. You know what? They're, they're a little bit higher in price or they're a little bit lower in THC or whatever, but this is what the turp is. This is what it tasted like. Uh, you know, like, their family unit, they're independent, you know, these are grassroots. This is how, you know, like, this is what I would suggest. And how do you get the bud tender to be educated on your product? If all they could see is just a brand that they have no association with, you know, like you're having to call literally, I, you know, you'd have to do cold calls and try and convince someone over the phone that, you know, this is what you are. And this is, and it's a sell, you know, and it's just so unorganic, you know, like it's just, it's the worst ever, you know, like, especially when you're looking at dealing with a flower, a plant that in and itself is such a social experience. And yet you have that huge disconnect before the sampling was allowed of trying to tell the bud tender, how the bud tender going to be able to sell your product without knowing it. So they literally are going to have to try the product at some point, yep. you know? So I think being able to bring people onto the journey, especially the bud tenders, it's uh it's a that's a huge move and that's what i mean about things i think are are slowly going to progress to be better because you can see that there's a change in attitude and that the government is making efforts 
you know, to try and uh, better the whole situation for everybody, not just the consumer or the retailer, but the producers as well. Yeah, the, the, the transitions are starting to be made. And there's like, we could spend hours here talking about <laughs> yeah. all of the changes that can be made. Like just, you've already touched on it with some of the taxing. And I was just, I had the excess tax sitting right there, ready to dive into if the topic didn't change. Right. Because that's another topic <laughs> yeah. that we could go into for, for endless amount of times. And it's just the industry as a whole, the more we are able to connect and communicate and have the ability to share stories with one another, the better the transition is going to be like I mentioned earlier with the drinks. The reason the beverage limits got changed was because there's enough people bitching about it and complaining. And all of us just said, well, enough's enough. And it seemed like it was the, the fruit on the lowest portion of the tree for the government to grab and give to us. But it's still a piece of fruit that we should celebrate and use as a stepping stone to get that next thing. For sure. I tell everybody the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, yeah. like how are they going to know that you, you know, this needs changing if you're not going to tell them, you know, like speak up. Like, you know, that's that's that whole thing about, you know, so my background is environmental science at York University. I've done grassroots, uh, you know, environmental movements. I've done all this stuff. And that's that whole thing about cannabis for craft. It's grassroots, you know, like and that's that whole part. If you want the industry to be better, you want things to transition you want the legislation itself. They're doing a legislative review right now of the act. Like they might overhaul. We don't know what they're going to overhaul. Right. Yeah. Um, all of those things. Now's the time to speak up. And, and you know, like I, I know, too, like it, it's intimidating being the craft guy. You don't want to stick your neck out, you know, and uh, and get chopped off. You know, like you don't want to be the one to raise up your hand and get singled out. So it's intimidating as well to be able to speak up and say, hey, this isn't right. This should be. You know, like maybe we could try it this way or just to bring up an issue and just say this needs to be examined. It's intimidating to do that because it's such a monolithic industry in terms of, you know, who's really got the government's ear and, you know, who's, who the legislation is built around in the first place. It's not built around the smaller guy. It's not mm-hmm. built around the, the craft. It's the commercial. It's the large guys. So it's intimidating to do that, but it's important. It's grassroots, you know, like. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to stand up for the craft and, and just say, you know, we're struggling here because of this. And hopefully, I mean, we can't actually, you know, make any promises, but at least that way, at least your voice is being heard. You know, you're you're speaking out. Well, that's exactly it. And then once you start speaking out, you'll start to find people who have a like mind with you and you'll be able to start having those conversations and finding possible solutions to these problems and continuing on this development in the industry that we need. And because one person screaming for change isn't going to do a whole bunch, but when you find other people who are asking for the same type of change, you can all start pushing for that style of change. Exactly. And I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say this, you know, when we were, when we were going up against, the health Canada for the transition from the MMAR to the MMPR, which they wanted to get rid of patients ability to grow their own plants. They also wanted to get rid of dispensaries at that time because they were just compassion centers, right? You would go in and you would be able to present your, you know, medical certificate and you'd be able to purchase your cannabis. These were the first stores that existed in Canada and they wanted to eliminate that. They wanted to eliminate the plants. So it was the first introduction of actual licensed producers was the MMPR and the government right away. Well, they wanted everybody to stop growing for themselves. So you have to purchase the LP's product. And I remember the judge, he said something to me and he, well, he said something to everybody who was there and he said, uh, people vote with their feet and people seem to go to these dispensaries. And so it's the same type of thing. The consumer themselves have been voting with their feet that, they're moving away from commercial, you know, like they're moving to, they want to have that experience. They want to be able to have real craft flower, you know, and appreciate the plant. It's that whole paradigm shift, that idea, you know, process, everything gets changed. And people right now are voting with their feet. Like you can see that there's a shift. There's a change in the energy in the Canadian uh, cannabis consumption level that, 
people want really nice product and they want to be able to be reassured that it's done in craft ways. So I'm hoping that helps. And like you said, too, uh, I'm hoping that it helps that uh, everybody gets to speak up a little bit, you know, like, if, like you said, if enough people do so, then hopefully that will ignite a little bit of change, you know, and alleviate the pressure on everyone. Well, absolutely. And, uh, and little change will make huge difference in the long run. Like the little change of the beverages made a huge difference for us. Yeah, well, even even like you said, the sampling with AGLC, yep. that is a huge game changer. It doesn't seem like it is. It, like in the grand scheme of things, it's very small potatoes. Yeah. But yeah. it really makes all the difference for the smaller guys who are kind of at a disadvantage in terms of resources and exposure, all of those things. This is a new outlet. That's a little change that makes a big impact. Yep. And it... And it's going to be interesting to see how the smaller companies are going to leverage that advantage of the sampling over the big companies. Like, yeah, the big companies are going to be able to throw flour at everyone. But are they going to be able to, like, if you just throw flour at everyone, how much of a real kind of unique experience are you creating? For I'm sure, and you know what, like, and let's be and stuff like that with these um, smaller companies, and that's yeah. going to create noise. Well, and let's be real too. You know, I'm sure sampling's been going on, yeah, regard before this. You know, this change had even happened, but at least <laughs> now, you know, the guys, the guys who, you know, the, the large companies that do do sampling before this, you know, change had happened, it's a slap on the wrist for them. They, yeah. they, you know, they're in, they're in, they have a seat at the table. You know, so it's intimidating and, you know, for the smaller guy to go ahead and do that and, you know, match what the big guy's doing and, and give out a sample and stuff. They really put their necks on the line because, you know, there's no uh, there's no leniency for the craft guy. You're on your own. You took the risk. That's what it is. Yep. So I think by doing that, yeah, you know, the bigger guys can definitely outsample the smaller guys, but the smaller guys can outsample them in terms of quality. You know, and just being able to know that, hey, I can go over to the store. I could go and talk to the bud tenders. I could give out samples. They could see my product and I could sleep at night knowing that I'm not going to get, uh, you know, my head chopped off for doing so. Well, that, you know, that's that's a really big thing. Oh, and, and where I was going with it, it was um, the larger companies are just going to flood the market with their samples and the smaller companies are doing like exclusivity drops and stuff like that, where it's like, hey, okay, we've got our R and D license. And now we're allowed to do sampling as well. So here, we're going to send you a pre-release because it's, it's going to hit AGLC next week and it's available. So that's allowed within the sampling, get that out there to an exclusive hundred bud tenders who are going to take part in a video call to learn about the product and visit with us and get feedback on it. That's so phenomenal. stuff like that is going to make a thousand times more noise than giving a thousand bud tenders three and a half grams of your product. A hundred percent. It's And that's that whole thing about being able to, you know, educate the bud tenders. Not that, you know, like, and I don't mean that in a way that it's like, they need to learn this. Like, no, it's just being able to introduce something to them and say, this is what we have. This is, you know, like, this is what our flower is. This is, you know, these are all the attributes. That's what I mean about educating the bud tenders that letting them have some exposure to it so that they can go, you know what, I can see what you're talking about. I, I understand why it's burning white. You guys do a flush for 25 days, you know, like you're flushing out water. I can see that there's no salts built up. There's no sparkling. There's no sulfur, you know, like all of those things that all comes out of that big change, you know, that little change that caused big change. Well, exactly. And, and, he, and for me, it, I look at it as, well, the bud tenders now got a story. It's like, oh, hey. I took a part of this really cool um, video call where I got to sit down with like 25 other bud tenders. We smoked this, one of these two new products. I ended up getting this one. I really liked it, right? The dough from you guys say you're, we're using you, for example, the dough from, from Primo, it just, it hit really well. Everyone loved it. That other one, the, why am I pulling a blank right now? Your other, your other genetic, um, Oh, the lava cake. The lava cake. There you go. The lava cake. The other half of the room had it. They loved it too. I'm going to be picking it up when I get paid on Friday. You want to try one of these two? They just released. That 
they'll tell to every single person that comes into the store and goes, Hey, what's new and exciting. Well, here's a story for you. Well, and if yeah. they're not excited, what's the likelihood that the customer is going to get excited about your product, try it and give honest feedback and, ex and be excited to go through that experience. A hundred percent, because that's that social, that's that, you know, it, it, it's a memory. It's an experience, like you said. So having that social, you know, and being able to, the craft guys have that opportunity to be part of that social, that's, that's going to change a lot of things. going to change a big dynamic, I think, you know, which I think is going to just help push along the, the craft, you know, over commercial. So oh, exactly. But yeah, I, you know, super happy that you were able to have me on today, you know, and I just want to leave everybody with, you know, we're family, we're independent. We're launching June 1st with OCS, with our lava cake and the dough. You know, we're, we're going to be at Lyft uh, in Toronto on June 1st. Uh, we've got the after party happening on the 2nd. I'm going to be at the Canvas Wiki. I, I, you know, if anybody sees us at any expos or any parties, come up to us. Come talk to us. We're, we're just real people. You know, we're not a corporate uh, entity or anything. And, uh, and just sharing that social and that experience. Awesome. I'm hoping to make it out to Toronto for Lyft. Uh, so most likely I will be able to uh, come and say hi and meet you in person. So that'll be good. Oh yeah, man. Uh, we'll have, we'll have a great time. You come out, we'll, you know, we'll roll a couple up and have an awesome time for sure. I look forward to it. Okay. So with that, let's wrap this one up. I had a great time talking with Wallace and I look forward to uh, seeing you on for Lyft. But with that, we'll wrap this one up. We'll see you guys tomorrow. I do have the 25th episode of the Bud Tender series following this one up. So thank you for coming on and I uh, look forward to seeing you out in Toronto. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate it, bro. Yeah, have a good one.